Shut up. This is a 1990 Lexus LS 400. And last month, Doug DeMiro reviewed not this car, but one similar to it. And I think he was unduly harsh. I think he was judging this car as if it were 10 or 15 years newer than it was. And I wanted to make a rebuttal as somebody who actually owns one of these cars. Now, if you haven't watched his review yet, it's really good. I'll post a link in the uh, description below. What I'm going to do is show you the quirks and features of this car that Doug DeMiro either mischaracterized or didn't bring up at all. And then I won't give it a score because I think Doug's scores are kind of arbitrary and kind of stupid. Now, before we go any further, I think it's important to point out that Doug tested a car with only 38,000 miles in pristine condition, basically a museum piece. This was the honest to goodness base model. No keyless remote, no power seat belt height adjuster, no traction control, no suspension height adjustment or sport mode, no sunroof, and biggest of all, no leather. Yes, this is an honest to goodness LS400 in the United States with cloth seats. And the material Toyota chose to use on this Lexus is held up really well, I think better than leather would have. Proof that the $38,000 base model of 1990 really did exist, showing my grandparents were willing to splurge on this car, but not splurge too much when they took delivery of this in October of 1989. So when it comes to the facts and figures of this car, Doug generally gets it right. It has a 4-liter V8, three-speed automatic with an overdrive button which he was really confused about why there's an overdrive button, and it's pretty simple. All through the 80s, cars had the PRND2L selector. So when a car started introducing overdrive, like a lot of Japanese cars did, rather than change up this well-known PRND2L, they added the overdrive button, which is the same as shifting from D to three on a modern car. And it makes a heck of a lot of sense if you live out here in the West where there's mountains. Sometimes you're coming down the mountain on the freeway and you don't want to burn up your brakes, hitting the brake the whole time down the hill. Well, to shift it down to three, you just pop out that button. No real magic to it, Doug. Don't forget to talk about how balanced the engine was, especially for the 1980s. So much so, Lexus made it part of their marketing. The Lexus LS400 is designed to stir the soul, and not much else. Lexus LS400 is designed to stir the soul and... No! <laughs> In his review, Doug was complaining about how the center stack looks really dated and plain. And I think he misses the main point of this car. The person buying a Lexus LS today is relatively young, 55, 60 years old. They're a baby boomer or an aging Gen Xer, somebody who was about McMansions and showing off with their money a bit. They grew up in times of prosperity. The people who bought this car were the silent generation. These were people who were born in the Great Depression, who maybe served in the Korean War or enlisted really young to serve in Japan. They lived very conservative lives. And so for them, the idea of luxury is something durable, something that lasts a long time. The new Lexus LS has all kinds of mouse controllers and feng shui, swooshy, I don't even know how to describe it. They're really high tech now, but it kind of reminds me of somebody who builds an office building to look really fancy and modern, and it just doesn't hold up well. It looks older sooner than it should. Now, I do concede the audio system in this car has not aged well when you compare it with modern systems. But again, the whole point of this rebuttal is, at the time, it was a fantastic system. You have to remember who was buying this car. Again, it was my grandfather, born in 1926, who forged his age to go into the Navy too young. If Toyota had come out with a 2018 LS, he wouldn't have bought it. He would have thought Japan was committing a second Pearl Harbor. When Lexus first offered this car, it had, I think, an unprecedented number of colors, 14 to choose from. This car happens to be taupe metallic. But at the wrecking yard about two weeks ago, getting a few parts to just kind of fix some odds and ends on this car, I came across a burgundy car with a red interior and everything was red. The seats were red, the trim was red, the steering wheel was even red. 
I've never seen any other car like it that wasn't an old Cadillac or something. Doug was complaining about the fan speeds. You have low, medium, and high, and that's it. As opposed to modern cars where you have a knob and you can adjust an infinite number of speeds, at least in theory. But to be fair, this is one of the best automatic climate control systems I've ever used. All last winter, I set it to auto. I set it to 72 degrees and I pretty much left it there. One of the other things it does neat as well is that it kind of automatically figures out which foot setting you want. So when I first get in the car, I, it would turn on the uh, defroster for the windshield. I don't think it had any kind of sensor or anything. I think it just knew that it was cold outside and naturally you'd want the defroster first rather than blowing useless ice cold air at your face and having to manually switch it. One of the long complaints I've had is that the speedometer is always off by about five to 10 miles per hour. It was one of the few durability quality control flaws this car had. It's annoying, but it's something you can live with. One of the things Doug complained about is the power antenna. But one of the things Doug didn't point out is that the antenna changes length depending on what station you're listening to. So it can be just perfect to pick up the exact wavelength of that frequency. I've never seen any other car that does that. Now, as we hop in the back seat here, I have to admit, it's pretty rudimentary. And Doug complains that compared to the modern Lexus, where you can control everything and fiddle with it with this center armrest control, in this car, all you have is an armrest. I'll be darned, it was 1989. Let's see, you can smoke, and you can adjust the vent. You can turn it on and off. And that's actually pretty cool when you're five years old. Because you gotta remember back in the 80s, I grew up with cars that didn't have air conditioning. Because back in the 70s and even into the 80s, air conditioning was like an upgrade feature to get into a higher trim car. Now, of course, on a $38,000 luxury car, you would expect that to be standard. But they didn't have to throw in special vents just for the kids in the back. That is pretty cool. Because I could sit here as a five-year-old and I could tip the vent up and down and left and right. And this one vent was just for me. And that was pretty special especially for 1989, Doug. And there's more things you could do. You can play with the map pocket. You can play with the other map pocket. You could sit here and open and shut the uh, ashtray. You can take the ashtray out and get yelled at by your grandparents for taking their car apart. Nothing was cooler than being a kid and actually sitting in the middle with this seatbelt stretched across you going this way and the other seat belt and this seat belt feeling like you're a race car driver and then grabbing onto both of these handles and being like that was the coolest feeling in the world doug doug also rightly pointed out how the back of the lexus has no ls 400 badging it just says lexus but again think of the generation that was buying it to my grandmother that was a selling feature oh i'd never have a rolls royce she couldn't afford a rolls royce because it has the big RR on the front and it's showy and it's gaudy. She wanted something that was just kind of blend in. Another one of Doug's illy placed complaints was that the fog lights are a weird color and they're up high rather than being down low where fog lights belong. The idea of hot fog lights being white and down low is that they see under the fog but of course, Lexus wanted it to look very conservative and have all the lights in a nice row because that's what somebody born in 1925 would have wanted. Now, one of the things I can see could be a problem with this design is that the idea is that the amber cuts through the fog when the white would just bounce off of it and blind you. But with this car, if you try to turn the white lights off, the amber ones turn off as well and you're just left with your parking lights. So that is a bit of a problem. Now, I do have to admit that does look kind of funny, but in the course of 30 years, I've maybe turned them on three times, four times now. Shut up. Shut up, your truck. It's what a muffler's for. And he's rolling coal. Rolling coal. How's that not illegal? And now it's time to give it a Rob score. No, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> you know, Doug DeMiro does a good job of finding all the little neat quirks and features hidden inside of a car, but there's some that are just out in the open that he missed about this car. Let's go through a few more of them real fast. On the wall of the trunk is the door to the first aid kit. And Doug overlooked this because he probably thought, oh, it's just a first aid kit. 
Should have pulled it out, Doug, because guess what there is? A special thing you can pull to pop open the fuel door. Should have checked that out, Doug. And while we're at it here, back in the 80s, you remember how you'd have these metal gas caps and there was nothing you could do with them, so you'd either put them on top of the pump and lose it, or you'd put it on your roof and you'd lose it. Some cars got really clever and they had a little metal hook you could hook it on, but it was small and a lot of people didn't think to do that. This is the first car I ever saw that made a little hook. Just like really obvious and convenient. And you know what? This is the original gas cap. It has never been lost. Find another car that's 30 years old from a previous era before car makers started doing that thing that still has its original fuel cap. And when you went to go to put it back on, it was one of the first cars I saw, probably, oops, probably for part of the venting system, that you didn't just tighten it up, you tightened it till it clicked. And that's how you knew everything was okie dokie and you could close the door till your next fuel up. And on the driver's side of the trunk is the Lexus Toolkit, which is one of the most ironic things about this entire brand. Because if you're wealthy enough to own a Lexus, you're not gonna work on it yourself. And even if you wanted to, when are you ever gonna need to work on your Lexus? That said, the kit features some nice things, a Lexus branded screwdriver, um, wrenches that have both 14 and 12, or 8 and 10, which frankly with those two wrenches and those four sizes, you could take apart probably half this car. And of course, the Lexus emblem rag, because obviously whatever mechanic works on your car needs to wipe his or her hands with a monogram Lexus rag. The Lexus LS400 came with dual exhaust. Mine's missing one of the caps. There are the alloy wheels. There were three different types that came on this car. The one that Doug reviewed actually had kind of a shinier appearance, where these are a little more plain aluminum alloy of some kind. The shape of these holes catch the wind a certain way to help cool the brakes. They should only be rotated between the front and the rear. Took it to the tire store and the guy pointed out, hey, your wheels are on backwards. The LS400 was one of the first cars to offer a sun visor over the mirror. And while we're hanging out near the mirror, the mirror itself doesn't have one of those hook things that flips back and forth. It's electric. You push the button, you push it again, it flicks between dim and non-dim. And the idea being electric, it can do that on its own. And then on the driver's side format, it was one of the first cars I ever saw that actually had a hook, a safety feature that's common in many cars now, but was first introduced on the LS400 as far as I can tell. This cruise control stock is kind of ubiquitous now, not just in Toyotas, but in almost any car. The LS400 is the very first car I ever saw it in. Now, Doug missed out on one cool thing about this valet button. He was saying you can put your key in there and lock it. Well, you know what? You can also just press it. And then it's in valet mode. Hand the valet the valet key and you're good to go. When Doug was talking about the tilt and telescope wheel, I can't believe he forgot to mention one cool feature, the auto tilt function. Put your key in and it lowers into place. When you're ready to get out of the car, just pull your key out. The LS400 was the first car I came across with automatic headlights. Not that the headlight stock had an automatic function per se, but Lexus would automatically turn the lights off if you opened the door. The LS400 had windshield wipers that would disappear. At least it appeared that way, especially for a car from 1989. You turn them on and the wipers would run and they'd be up and down. But then when you went to turn the wipers off, they would drop back into a position where you couldn't see them anymore. And uh, speaking of the wiper though, you can't turn it to high unless the windshield is really wet, like from a downpour. It's electronically hooked into, so I can, I can pull the stock down to high, but it won't stay there unless it decides electronically it wants to do that. Under the hood, Doug talked about how exposed and easy to see this V8 was that Lexus made, that they were proud of it and they wanted to show it off. But in 1989, this thing was shrouded to heck. I remember my dad complaining. He says, nobody can ever work on this car. Everything's covered up. 
it's all this plastic, but you have to remember the context. A 10-year-old vehicle was 1979, and an engine bay on a 1979 car was a big open thing with, like, an engine taking up 25% of the bay. By comparison, this thing was impossible to work on. One thing my grandmother did like, though, is she talked about how all the labeling in a time when symbols were taking over, well, especially on import cars, English writing was on just about every cap. And she liked that because she knew exactly where to pour her fluids in, wiper fluid, oil. Not that she ever had to do that that much. One thing Doug missed in his perusal of the owner's manual is the section on trailer towing. That's right, the LS400 can apparently tow up to 2,000 pounds. I'd love to see the new LS owner's manual tell you you could tow with your Lexus. Safety first. You know, one of the things Doug mentioned that I think got me offended enough <laughs> to post this video in the first place is he described driving this car as, oh, it's nothing special, it just feels like I'm driving a Camry. And I think that's where he gets really mistaken. He treated this car like it's just a run-of-the-mill car, forgetting very quickly how bad cars were in the 80s. Do you remember how bad they were? Why did Honda and Toyota get their reputation for being so good? It was because everybody else was so bad, having to do valve jobs after 90,000 miles, and Toyota got their reputation because they'd go 150,000 trouble-free miles, or sometimes 200,000, we just, oh, we were in awe. Toyota used to have on their website, not that long ago, it's probably about 1998, the 100,000 mile club, because it was so special for a car to go 100,000. I mean, now even the worst Chevy should go at least 200,000 without any trouble. And here's Toyota investing about half a billion dollars in the engine alone on this car to try to build a car that would go 400,000 miles. Doug was complaining too about not being able to hustle the corners, you know. He says it feels kind of floaty. That's because at speeds below 50 miles an hour, the power steering pump makes the steering light. And it's one of the only cars I know of that the power steering pump tightens the steering up as you go faster, instilling a lot of confidence on the freeway. And I think if Doug had had a chance to take this car out on the freeway... Not to be hustled. Not to be hustled. Not to be hustled. 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 Oh, get out of my way. Goodbye. So long. Auf Wiedersehen. Good night. I'm only revving at like 1,000 RPM. <laughs> Instead of going 80 miles an hour. Now, that may be a little bit overly optimistic. You just have so much more power to keep going. Okay. Pull over on the dirt here. See, it's still nice and smooth on the dirt. Did I cover all the stuff missing about the LS400? Leave your comments below. Don't forget to hit subscribe. And thank you for watching. Doug even complained about the sound of the horn. He said that made it sound like a Geo. That does not sound like a Geo. That sounds like a Japanese luxury car should sound. A Japanese luxury car is not going to sound like a Suburban or a train.